People don't even know that they're going through perimenopause. Suicides happen, depression, anxiety, divorces, separations, all because we're not aware of what is actually happening in our bodies. It starts with the nutrition. So number one would be fiber. Ultra processed food is almost fiberless. And so we're eating 65, sometimes 70% food that's fiberless. Amy Shaw, MD, is a double board certified medical doctor and nutrition expert with training from Cornell, Columbia, and Harvard universities. She's also a best-selling author and one of the most recognized professionals sharing science-backed health information throughout social media with well over a million followers. We can't even say that you're a special guest at this point. Uh, you're basically <laughs> family. You're faculty I, 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 of I the Model return, return too many times to be called a guest anymore. And you brought along an intern. Yeah. Right. She's just outside That's, the door now, but yeah. she sat in here with us earlier. I know, special. I'm trying to like, you know how we just talked about it, like osmosis, yeah. gut bacteria goes from one to the other. Um, best thing you can do is spend time with them. Yeah, and we're talking about your daughter, yeah. by the way, 14. Yeah. She's 14 and you have a 16 year old son. Yep. And um, you just said it, you know, the environment. And one of the things that, you know, we're talking about before the show was just them traveling with us and us taking them to these different events and things like that. That exposure is profound in of itself. But one of the things that I most love about it is that other people get to educate my kids. Yeah, exactly. Even though they might be saying the same thing, exactly. but it's coming from someone else, it hits different. 100%, because you can just say anything to your spouse, to your friends, to your parents, to your children. You can't make anybody do anything. Um, you have to just show them what you do. You have to show them who you're spending time with. You have to have them exposed to different environments. Um, that's how change happens. So it's, mm. it's really, really, it's a great education for them. Yeah. We're going to talk about change happening today. Yeah. And you've done so much work around the microbiome and how it impacts all these different aspects of our health. But I want to start off by talking about the number one, the world's number one free probiotic that some people might not know about. Let's talk about that. Yeah. It's exercise. Free, accessible. I mean, what else could you be doing for your gut health that's better than that? I think that is the number one thing that is, like you said, free, accessible, available to all. Mm. Um, I think people think of probiotics as this expensive medication and which one should I take? And there's so many. And you have this accessible tool that's so important and vital for your gut microbiome right there. Um, so I want to, and I don't think people realize that exercise make the gut bacteria happy. Mm. They grow certain bacterial strains that produce short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids, if we could bottle that up, it is like the anti-inflammatory miracle drug. It goes all over the body, calms the brain. Um, it goes to your muscles, all the places where you have chronic inflammation. Um, short chain fatty acids are just magical for our body. And sometimes people think that part of the benefit that you get in, from your, you know, exercise to your brain is not just um, the neurochemical changes. It's also the short chain fatty acids that are helping with that inflammatory cascade in the brain, helping it calm down. So it's exercise. I can't say more about exercise. And you know, it's simple as walking. I think people don't even think of walking as exercise. And I think over the last 10 years, I've realized that people think of walking as like, oh, it's not even worth it. I might as well just sit and then go to my workout for an hour or 45 minutes at the yeah. gym. And that's just not true. Yeah. That walking counts. I was the last person on the planet to get an Apple watch, but I got it because I wanted to count all the steps. Like if I, <laughs> if I you know, don't get a chance to go to the gym and I looked down at my steps and I had 10,000 steps, I feel, okay, you know what? I got my workout for the day. And so I think um, exercise, especially walking exercise is something that, we could easily be doing for our gut brain hormone connection. I love that. I think that this is flipping on the light switch for us because it's not just, you know, we think about improving heart health, for example, with exercise, we could superficially think, you know, you, you got your blood flowing, the circulation, mm -hmm. you know, positive chemistry, mm -hmm. you're burning calories. Mm -hmm. But part of it is what 
is happening with your microbiome and the scaphas, those short chain fatty acids that are getting produced that are also supporting your heart health. Like it's, it's so multifaceted, but we don't think about it. And I'm glad that you mentioned, and I wanna talk more about this because walking is having a moment mm -hmm. right now, which is important, but it's just like, it's the number one human exercise. Like we're bipedal creatures, you know? It's just like, this is what we're designed to do. But you mentioned there's this phenomenon and the label that we give them is the active sedentary, right? Yep. So we sit all day at our jobs, in our cars, you know, at home, but then we go to the gym for an hour a day or whatever the case might be. And even still, and that's wonderful, by the way, let's not negate that hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's amazing. It's putting you in elite status in our society. But realistically, you're only about 4% more active than the rest of the sedentary population. You know, we're designed to move around, you know? And so having more of these exercise snacks yes. as well, can you talk a little bit about this new data on doing some air squats? Yeah. Talk about that. So, you know, a lot of people say to me, and they probably say to you too, that's great. But I work a job where I have to be on camera or in person all day long. And I just was in New York um, in these meetings and I was in that situation where literally it is like PowerPoint after PowerPoint, meeting after meeting, and you're in a room. And I thought to myself, okay, I get it. You know, so this new data came out that said every 45 minutes um, to an hour, if you get up and you do 45 seconds worth of squats, you can actually negate some of the negative effects of sitting. And for people who are in sedentary um, jobs and where they really can't get up for eight hours um, outside the room, this is a great strategy. You can get up, I mean, especially with these hybrid things where you're on Zoom meetings and you have like five minutes before between go to the bathroom, come to your air squats and get ready for the next one. And I think it's so empowering to think, okay, I can do something that can counteract the negative effects of sitting all day. Um, so I thought that was great because I think people need to search for different ways. Like I was on an airplane, right? And I thought to myself, all right, when I get, when I'm waiting for my flight, I'm going to pace and then I'm going to do some, I could do some air squats if I want to, and then I'm ready to sit for a few hours. And I think gives it gives you the power back in your hands. Yeah, I love that. And I think that the data was like, it was comparable to like 30 minutes of like straight, exercise. you know, walking or yes. exercise, or whatever yeah. the case might be. And it's just being more creative, like starting to see our environment a little bit differently, but also like we tell ourselves that we can't, like there's yeah. a story that we have. And maybe again, our life is structured in a way, we can't get away for 30 minutes of exercise, but doing those 45 seconds of air squats, you know, every hour can get that same benefit, but it's more of like a snack. But because it's a snack, we don't see it the same way as like getting the full buffet. Have you, do you do Peloton? Do you know, do you have a Peloton bike? Okay, so during the pandemic, you know, everybody was doing Peloton and Peloton's have, has these classes. It's like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever. And I used to hate it because I, I don't like to leave things early. And I thought to myself, well, if I can't finish a whole 45 minute ride or a whole 30 minute ride, like I, I don't want to start it. And that's how a lot of people feel yeah, like yeah. you don't want to, you don't feel like you want to go to the gym because you can't be there for an hour or you can't be there. And what I've learned is that actually you could go for 15 minutes. You could walk, go for a walk in between calls. Now I've incorporated so much in my life. I tell people all the time, I'll say, Hey, you want to go for a walk? Maybe meet. And they're like, you want to go for a walk? And I'm like, yeah, instead of meeting for dinner or, meet it for, or for, for coffee, especially with girlfriends. Um, and it's a way to add an activity to your day. And it feels really good because you can't do a lot of other stuff while you're walking. You can't be multitasking. You can't be on your phone and you're really paying attention to that person and uh, connecting with them while also getting your workout in. Awesome. Awesome. Now there's some groundbreaking data regarding the microbiome and menopause. Mm. And this, again, like Thankfully, there's a lot of information coming out about this because as you know, a lot of the research that's been conducted over the years, whether it's for pharmaceuticals, whether for supplements, lifestyle interventions, they've really been based primarily on men and men's biology. And so much about women's health has just really been ignored. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's changing rapidly right now. And this process that every woman goes through is really getting a bright spotlight put on it. And one of the biggest, again, most groundbreaking new piece of data is looking at the microbiome changes in perimenopause. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. So people don't even know that they're going through perimenopause. I had um, a cu my cousin who's my, like my best friend, she was visiting and I was doing a video on perimenopause for social media. And I said, I, I need you to be a part of it or whatever. It was like a, we had to have a conversation. And she said to me, but I'm not in perimenopause. And I said, yes, you are. And she said, well, what? So most people don't even know that they're in it. So if you're in your 40s, you're definitely going through perimenopause. Perimenopause just means like the 10 years or so prior to menopause. And so the average age of menopause is around 52. So you're talking about your early 40s. Some people goes, you know, goes from uh, 45 um, all the way to 52. So some people in their 30s are also starting to experience these changes. Um, and it doesn't necessarily, there's no blood test that tells you you're in perimenopause and there's no um, definitive symptom. And so I think a lot of people don't realize. Um, so that be, that definition being said, those years, late 30s, 40s, late 40s, and early 50s, they can be the most tumultuous years of your life. Because it's not like your hormones just gradually go down and then stop at menopause. It's like, this roller coaster. Um, it's, I equate it to the end of the toothpaste tube. You know, one, one time you squeeze it and you get a full squeeze. The next time you get a splatter. The next time you get nothing, you know, it's, you don't know what you're going to get. And that's what your ovaries are doing as they approach menopause. And therefore, when you get a full squeeze, you'll have a normal month. Like you'll be your mood, your energy, your um, appetite, your um, cravings will all be kind of baseline. Then you'll get that splatter month and you'll be like, why do I feel like crap? Why am I so mad at my partner? Why do I feel not myself? Then you go to your provider and they say, nope, you're fine. Just go home. You're just getting older. And it's frustrating, right? Like at, nobody's really explaining what's happening. If you understood the mechanism, you could say, oh, maybe that's what's happening. Um, nobody tells you that your vitamin D levels might drop, your cholesterol levels might change, um, that your vitamin, that the way you absorb food may change because you've got microbiome changes during this time. We have hormone receptors. Um, even our bacteria depend on hormones. And so as our hormones fluctuate, the bacteria changes. And so the bacterial kind of ecosystem that you once had is now different. Mm -hmm. And that to women, when I tell people that, they're like, oh, I see, I knew it. You know, I, I knew I didn't do anything different, but all of a sudden now I have cholesterol issues or um, I have vitamin D issues or um, I'm not able to tolerate certain foods that I was able to eat. So that I think is um, not only empowering, giving people body literacy, but it also gives them solutions. So once you realize, oh, it's my microbiome that's changing, then you can think of all the solutions that could help support that and make these years maybe not so um, out of control and stressful for you. This is so good, so <laughs> profound. So one of the big takeaways from today for everybody is that your hormones are impacting your microbiome. And in perimenopause, you're having changes with your hormones taking place. And again, this can be a variety of different symptoms we might experience, but they can either get ignored, oh, you're just getting older. And also, of course, perimenopause and menopause as well. Or you get diagnosed, oh, oh, you ha just have an anxiety disorder. Yeah. Right? Even though you're, you might have been fine the next month. Right. Right? But we're not looking at these things or considering that the body is changing, the hormones are changing, and we need to do things a little differently as things are changing and helping to create an environment where that change is more graceful is what I'm hearing yeah. you say. Well, I think women often feel like in our culture, as they approach those ages, um, that they're being thought of as like no longer beautiful or useful, productive. And um, I think when you explain what's happening to the body and how we can support it, we can m empower women to feel more powerful, more productive, more you know beautiful, more stronger. Uh, like for example, my mom said, 
and I think this is true for most mothers going through um, menopause, she just thought her body was out of control. She said, she goes, I thought I was going crazy and I thought my body was just out of control. And that feeling that you don't know what's going on and nobody's validating it for you Mm -hmm. is just the worst. And I said to her, because she comes from a very strong community of mothers and sisters and um, women in her community. She grew up in India where there's lots of conversations. And she said, nope, we had no idea what was happening. We all, you know, the mother said we went through it. The aunt said we went through it, but nobody had any clue what was going on or any clue how to fix it. And so I think that's so crazy to me that we have had generations of people suffering for 10, sometimes 20 years. Um, Suicides happen, depression, anxiety, um, all kinds of uh, divorces, separations, all because we're not aware of what is actually happening in our bodies. And we just think that either ourselves or our family members or our friends or our community members are um, going crazy, quote unquote, or having a midlife crisis or um, having some other problem when it's really coming from these changes. Mm. Oh. Okay. Um, let's talk about some practical things. Just knowing that you could be going through this process or are going through this process or somebody that you care about is going through this process to support, as we know, and we've talked about on previous episodes and we'll put your past appearances uh, in the show notes for people, but we know that our microbiome is impacting our neurochemistry. It's impacting our immune system function. It's impacting our emotions. It's impacting our cardiovascular health. There isn't a part of us, our skin health, there's an aspect of human health that isn't impacted deeply by the health of the microbiome. So with this being said and these changes, what are three things that mm. women can proactively do to support those changes by supporting what's happening with the microbiome? I love that question. So it's kind of like the brain, the and microbiome is kind of like the second brain, as you know, a lot of people think of it as second brain, but it's a second control center. So I think of um, the walkie talkies, the, um, the microbiome, the bacteria have walkie talkies with our brain and our brain's communicating with the microbiome. So when you think about that, the inputs that you put into your gut um, are being translated by these gut bacteria and communicated to the brain. So that being said, nutritional changes are the best way. I mean, lifestyle and nutrition is the basis of everything I'm going to say, because I think we, I, I totally believe in medications and hormone therapy and helping women through this time, but it starts with the nutrition. So number one would be fiber. And I think what happens is Fiber in our world, you know, 90% of people aren't getting enough fibers. I think we're, you know, we're dealing with a larger issue, but definitely as your microbiome changes, your, some of that gut bacteria that's dependent on estrogen is dying and you need to support the growth of good gut bacteria. And how do you do that? You feed them, you feed them food that they eat and that's fiber, right? And so in our world, and we talked about this in other episodes, ultra processed food is almost fiberless most of the time. And so we're eating 65, sometimes 70% food that's fiberless or is not used by the gut bacteria. Prebiotics. Yeah, it's 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 useless, the uh, ultra processed food. And so um, we need to be eating food that has more fiber in it so that we can feed that good gut bacteria. I actually have a mnemonic for the three things that um, I tell people to do, it's 30-33. So the second thing I was gonna tell you is protein. So 30-33 stands for 30 grams of protein in your first meal, 30 grams of fiber throughout the day, and three probiotic foods in your day. So probiotic foods, and it can go in in succession. So you could start with just getting 30 grams of protein in your first meal, like start there, because it's, Sounds easy, but 
you know, it's going to take a little bit of work. You might have to switch your breakfast from having, you know, toast and a coffee to having eggs and cottage cheese, or maybe it's yogurt and, you know, um, uh, something with that. So getting 30 grams in your first meal, it doesn't have to be first thing in the morning. I, I'm not, I still believe in overnight fasting, but the first meal of your day to get 30 grams, that's a first step. Protein is communication. It, your gut can communicate to your brain that you are full. Your gut can communicate to um, your brain that you don't need any more snacks. So the cravings go down, your energy levels go, go up. And especially in the beginning of that day, um, it's really good input for your gut bacteria. And then the 30 grams of fiber, which is not easy, especially if you're eating, you know, the typical 50 to 70% ultra processed foods. Um, adding fiber to your diet means something like what you always talk about, just having more fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds. Um, you can actually get that. It's not so hard if you're eating a ton of nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables in your diet, in every meal. Um, so you can get to 30 grams. And then the three probiotic foods, that I think is the hardest when you first hear about it, because there is pretty much nothing in our typical American diet that fits into that probiotic um, food list, except for maybe yogurt. And so yogurt is probably the easiest way to get your probiotics. Um, now you can get probiotic cottage cheese also. Um, pro there's even probiotic cream cheese. Lots of dairy products have now come out with a probiotic um, option like kefir. And then sauerkraut, kimchi, um, pickles, pickles, oh, but certain real pickles. pickles. Yes, exactly. And then um, also apple cider vinegar, the raw one, if you add it to your salad dressing or some water, mm -hmm. could be an easy way for you to get more probiotic foods into your life. So probiotic foods, it almost takes some intentionality to actually get them in. I mean, most people are not eating yogurt. They're not, some, some people are eating yogurt, but they're eating like the one with the, M&M's on top and that's heat process. So the probiotics are all killed in that. M&M's? Yeah. You know, there's, there's all those, um, yogurts that have like toppings and he doesn't even know about this. Gosh. Holy okay. moly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know people are wilding out out here with these foods, but yeah. yeah, I didn't know that. There's, there's all kinds of, um, processed, ultra processed yogurts now too. So, you know, you want, wow. you want to stick to actual I no yogurt. Idea. I had stopped eating dairy for a really long time because I thought it was inflammatory for me. But what I realized is fermented dairy mm -hmm. actually was really helping me grow my gut bacteria. So I, I urge people who are staying away from dairy just because they heard it somewhere or, um, you know, maybe they don't even know if it bothers them to try a little bit of fermented dairy, like a yogurt or a cottage cheese or a kefir and see how you feel. Cause that could really help your gut actually in some ways. Um, of course, if you're doing it for, religious or spiritual or, um, you know, environmental reasons, that's different, but if you're just avoiding dairy because you think it's not good for you. You may want to try this. Awesome. Awesome. So 30, 33 is where I tell women often, actually anybody can do it, but really, especially in that perimenopausal range where women are feeling lots of fatigue, they're feeling the visceral fat, the fat around the midsection, they're noticing um, worse than sleep, which we talk about a lot. They're often noticing cravings and like sugar cravings going up. And also like their cycles are um, really irregular. Their mood cha changes, they have more anxiety. Um, all of that can really improve when you improve nutrition. Amazing. This is, it is so simple. It's not necessarily easy, especially no. if you're not doing this already, but getting in this fiber, which functions again as a prebiotic for yes. your friendly bacteria that you want to support as it's changing. So providing a variety of different fiber inputs, which just means eat a variety of different foods. Yeah. Uh, the protein, 30 grams, ideally if you can get in that first meal. And what that does too, even just, it does, the, being able to break this protein down into these, into these amino acids to do to build your hormones in yeah, the first place. Exactly, like you yeah. need to get this protein. And also what that does is you mentioned the satiety impact, yeah. but it tells your body that you are okay. Yeah. It's, it's a safety signal. You know, it's like being able to start your day and our bodies, even though we have all this fancy stuff, I saw people piling into a Tesla as I was driving in 
And, you know, it looked like some thugs, you know, to be honest, like, you know, but there's just some regular guys, but it's just weird seeing these tough guys getting into a Tesla, you know, it just, it was like an oxymoron. That's hilarious. Um, but we have all of this, these fancy innovations, but our bodies are operating on this very, I don't even want to say primitive, but just ancient yeah. programming. And when you have a high quality food source, protein source in your body, it's like you win. It's like telling your biology that you are going to be okay today. Oh, I you love know? it. Yeah. So I, I am the perfect example. I ate abysmal amounts of protein, um, probably up, up until maybe five years ago, because I grew up vegetarian. Um, I am very, very busy. And I, I, ate, I ate a lot of salads. I was healthy, quote unquote. But when I started to learn that you lose one to 3% of your muscle mass in your forties and, you know, all through perimenopause and menopause. And I thought to myself, all right, how do I build muscle? Then, um, you know, I started working with this trainer and they said, well, why don't you log your food for a day, a couple of days. And they're like, looking at me, like you're eating like 30 to 50 grams a day. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like what yeah. you should be eating on one meal. And so I had to radically change the way I was eating, um, and so I think this is something that's really empowering for women because they're like, if you do this one thing, you're going to start noticing changes right away. Yeah. And it's because it's impacting everything. everything. Wow. I love this. And of course, the final one was the ferments. And you, you mentioned a bunch of different sources. We talked about this earlier um, before we, we were recording for the show, but I had a friend come over and, you know, We've been friends for years and he's never like been like super serious about like there's some recommendation. We were talking in this show called Shogun came up somehow and he put his hand on my shoulder. He looked me dead in my eyes like, Sean, you have to watch this show. And I'm just like, okay, all right, I'll check it out. And I get it. For me, it's, it's beautiful cinematography. Yeah. Yeah. That's, but you know, maybe it's just not there yet as far as like why he's so serious about it. Maybe he's just super into, you know, um, those storylines. But one of the scenes in there was, you know, this foreign guy, the this barbarian as they call him, but he's just, you know, he's a guy from the UK. Um, and I don't want to give too many spoilers, by the yeah. way. But there's a scene where they give him some some natto yeah. to eat. Yeah. And the 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 Japanese people in the room are just like, don't, you know, don't even try to give this to him. He's not going to like it. And he started eating. He was like, this is kind of like cheese, you know, yeah. it reminds me of this. And they're just marveling at, but also he's, he's he, at this point, he's clearly hungry for, you know, he's just, he just wants to eat stuff. Um, but just seeing in this culture in Japan, and this is what we talked about earlier, 5% obesity rate versus here in the United States, inching its way up to 50% and significantly lower rates of all manner of chronic diseases, heart disease, Alzheimer's, the list goes on and on. Um, there's something, there's a lot of things right with the culture. Yeah. One of the big standout ones, and this is affirmed in the data now, is the nutrition. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that natto. Do you have you had natto? natto? Yes, of course. Yeah. My um my son said on TikTok, it was like there's this uh, trend about how to eat natto. Uh, from people who love it. And they say like, you have to whip it with rice. And once mm. you whip it, it, it has a different flavor and uh, texture. And um, so we would regularly go to Japanese restaurants to have that with them because he, they, they thought it was cool because they saw it on TikTok. And I was mm. like, great, a way to get in fermented foods for these kids. It's really hard, right? Like to think of different ways to incorporate fermented food. It's one thing as adults to say, okay, I need to eat more, kimchi or sauerkraut, but it's another thing to have your kids who don't usually eat any of that thing, stuff to incorporate it into their lives. Um, yeah. So that's a, I, but I love the Japanese culture because there's so many fermented foods still today that they eat. Yeah. yeah. When I was working at the university that I attended, you know, I got to work with people from all over the world. And this was a couple, obviously it was a couple years into it, but it hit, I start to see some of the data about fermented foods and I just start to ask people from different countries if they had a fermented food. Every culture ate cultured foods. Yeah. Like, there was some folks I was training from Ethiopia that had some form of bread that they would have, a fermented bread. Yeah. Um, yes, they have, it's like a sourdough. Yeah, and it, yeah. the name escapes me. I know somebody's like Injera. shouting it right. Injera. Injera. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but then, you know, again, I didn't really know about kimchi, yeah. but then, you know, just finding out about that from, you know, Korean folks, um, obviously, and my mom used to eat sauerkraut, yeah. you know, when I was a kid, shout out to the folks in Germany. Yeah. Um, but there are versions of this in, in every culture, some kind of fermented food. And I, I love the fact that it's called cultured foods yes. and every culture has them. But we've kind of gotten away from that. We've gotten into this place of more and more ultra processing, more and more demonization of bacteria. Yeah. Right. So this super sterile Twinkie, yes. right? That no bacteria can even break down if it tried to, right? It can live for, you know, remember that McDonald's meal that they found from like years and years and yeah. it's like still intact? Barely yeah. even broke down. Yeah, right? It's crazy. It's, um, and I was actually talking to this researcher who's from India and, you know, in Indian food, there's a lot of fermented food, but they cook it like they steam it or whatever. So I said to him, well, then bacteria dies, right? Because you're cooking it. And he's like, bacteria are so hardy. You know, there are bacteria that live in that, um, even when you cook these fermented batters or whatever, you still have things that live in there that mm -hmm. actually go and feed your gut. And so it's like sourdough bread, for example, you know, you're cooking it, but there's still mm -hmm. some fermentation process left or some ferments left in there. Um, and so I thought to myself, okay, well, it's not so hard then in our lives to start incorporating these foods, but you would never do it if you're eating the typical American diet. I mean, there's just no way. Yeah. This reminds me of like, you know, we've got all these different microbes, you know, fungi, we've got viruses, we've got bacteria. We also have archaea. Yeah. And some of these things they're finding like even residues from like lava, volcano yes. lava, you know, exactly. being able That's to see like saying. these things still survive yes. in these crazy conditions, frozen, obviously they can yeah. be, you know, frozen in the Arctic and they're finding, you know, different viruses, which is kind of creepy by the way. I know. Um, but you but know. But that's example he gave was the volcano bacteria that live mm -hmm. in volcanic rock. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, the, um, they're subjected to extreme high heats. It's crazy. And we take on in a weird way, some of these properties, yeah. you know, um, unless we make our property value go down. See, this analogy is pretty fire. Yeah. Um, so, but keeping our property value high, what are some specific nutrients as well? Um, because there's certain nutrients that the microbiome absolutely love yeah. and helps to thrive, create a thrive, thriving environment. What about something like omega-3s? Yeah, omega-3s. And polyphenols, those are two things that come jump out at me besides fiber and fermented food. Omega-3s are vital. As we know, we talk about it a lot for the brain, um, that they're so vital in our brain health, um, but they're also vital in our cardiovascular health and in our for our gut health. Uh, Omega-3 fatty acids are not as easy to get sometimes, and I think that's one of the things that I personally... Um, supplement with because people always ask me like what do you supplement with and they say if you can get omega-3 fatty acids from your foods amazing but some people we don't you know in cultures that live really close to the ocean they're getting a lot of omega-3 fatty acids from fish um, but often in our modern cultures we have to actually create a diet that has more omega-3 fatty acids or take supplemental omega-3 fatty acids. And if you don't eat fish, then you need to take plant-based algae omega-3 and that can be really beneficial to you. Um, there are some studies that show that people that don't eat omega-3s um, actually do, uh, you know, don't eat fish, sorry, do, uh, are better at extracting omega-3 from the foods that they do eat. Our bodies are so smart. And um, so there is... It's like, even if you're not from a family that eats a ton of fish, but um, if you're good about incorporating some omega-3 fatty acid foods, it, your body will extract that. Um, so I think omega-3s is something that you can easily either get from foods or start to supplement with. So that's something easy. Polyphenols is the blueberries, the um, green tea, it's the coffee, it's a... It's these um, antioxidants that live mm. in these foods that are uh, brightly colored. And so nature is so smart. Like you talk about this all the time, like nature is so smart. They're giving us signals like eat this food. You know, it's bright, it's um, colorful cabbage, you know, all these uh, purple and blue and 
uh, brightly colored fruits and vegetables, they are giving us a ton of polyphenols. And these polyphenols are antioxidants, so anti-aging. They uh, So oxidation is what really ages your cells. So you're anti-aging. And um, this is really, really important for our gut bacteria as well. They love polyphenols. They use polyphenols to make postbiotics. Um, so have you ever heard of urolithin A? It's another compound. It's like a postbiotic compound. There's companies that you know get, you can supplement with it, but when you eat polyphenols, your gut bacteria make these amazing life-lengthening compounds, um, longevity compounds like urolithin A. Um, so polyphenols is something um, that is really, really important. I think. Um, you probably talked about this in Eat Smarter, but you know, blueberries, what I love about them, and I tell the kids all the time, is that they have some immediate cognitive boosting. It's like within 30 to 60 minutes of consuming a cup of blueberries, you will get the cognitive benefit. So not only are you feeding the gut bacteria, not only are you making postbiotics, but you're also um, boosting your brain at that moment. So I think those kind of things... Um, or something you can add to your diet. So I, when you, when I say 30, 33, the 30 grams of fiber, I'm assuming, and um, I usually tell people to break that down into fruit, um, including berries and um, vegetables, including leafy greens, because all of those have high polyphenol content. And that automatically gives your body um, the polyphenols. And then nuts and seeds, um, that give your body the omega threes and also the fiber. So that thirty grams of fiber, really, if you're eating real food, you're already getting all the things you need to. Yeah, uh, love it. I love it. Now, with this, with this process and more education going towards perimenopause and menopause, another critical aspect of this and longevity as well. And we were talking about this earlier too, and how evolution gave this precious gift of grandmothers, right? And being a species that's pretty unique and seeing past menopause, lengthy lifespan with humans that isn't really seen anywhere else in any other species. With that being said, we have to protect and cultivate a culture that supports women as women are aging. Recently, in the last few decades in particular, these this has been fractured. Yeah. And we're turning this around. We're changing this right now. There's an important role with relationships that plays into menopause and perimenopause and longevity. And I want to talk about that next. Yeah. So what what is your recent research saying about the importance of relationships for women's health? Yeah, I think, you know, you pointed what you were saying before about women, um, humans, human females being one of the only species on planet Earth, uh, that and a few whale species that actually can live past menopause. So can live well past menopause. Their ovaries may be done, um, but they're able to live. And why would that be? Most other animals, once they stop procreating, once their ovaries don't function, they die. And the theory is, is that women have been essential in the evolution um, it, of, of humans. They take care of their own children and they take care of their grandchildren. They take care of people in the community and they, um, they contribute to society. And when you think about that, it's like, oh my gosh, these women are so, so vital in society that evolution had picked them to live longer well past 30, 40 years past menopause. And I think that's beautiful. It just shows you that we do have a role and a purpose and um, a contribution to society. And that if you engage in that, um, so I tell women all the time in perimenopause and menopause, hey, you need to engage in your purpose, in your role, whatever that is for yourself um, and get involved with something you've always wanted to do, um, help the people you've always wanted to help, connect with the people you've always wanted to connect with because not only is that helping the community, that's helping yourself um, live a long and healthy life. Oh, you're the best. I love talking with you. Yeah. And our past conversations 
have planted little seeds that are now blossoming into things like a new show yeah. that you have. You have a new podcast. Yeah. Tell everybody about that. Well, I want to thank you because um, you are uh, uh, were just a guest on my new podcast. And um, I tell people all the time, I, I by the way, I tell people this freely all the time. But there's a few people that have been so key in my um, career as this new career after, I would say, um, medicine is my overall career, but being a doctor in the clinic was my first career. And then being a doctor outside the clinic is my new career. And you've been one of the most um, influential people in that journey. And I, and I don't think I say it enough. I know I've said, say it a lot, but I don't say it enough because I think that people need to um, celebrate those people who help others and help you, you know, help guide the way. And mm. um, like I said, I think sometimes when you see that someone sees something in you or that um, they think that you're doing a good job or something, it also plants that seed in your own head um, and it helps you manifest that because you're like, oh, well, someone sees something in me and someone is supporting me on my journey. Like I should do it or I can do it. And I think that's been really, really important. You're the best. Thank oh, you. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm so just happy for you, but I knew this was going to happen. Of course, you know, it's so funny. You know, sometimes, like you said, like, I was just like, why are you not like bursting out of the room with confidence about all these things? Like you're all the, you're checking all these boxes, but you know, it's just, it's a process, you know, especially yeah. when you have a, a, a certain life and this is for everybody listening, you know, and this even ties back to what you said earlier with menopause and, you know, still understanding and embracing that you have a purpose, mm -hmm. that you have value, that you, that you matter. And, you know, and for us also to celebrate that and to start to cultivate more of that uh, in our lives and in our relationships, especially with women who, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but just the fact that medicine has been so negligent of actually including women in research because there's so many different things going on with women's bodies, women's brains, but we treat women like as, um, you know, my colleague, our colleague, uh, Dr. Lisa Moscone says, we treat, treat women like smaller men. Yeah. You know, and, and just look at where that's gotten us and we could turn all this stuff around and your unique experience and education and communication style and the walk in the talk and yeah. having your daughter here, <laughs> you know, who's interning and all this stuff is just really special. And so can you share what your, the name of your podcast? Yeah. It's called Save Yourself with Dr. Amy Shaw. And you can find it, you know, everywhere your where podcasts are now audio, video, like we said, everywhere. Um, and I think what we, re what I realized is I was just started and I did a few episodes and what I saw really resonated were these kind of conversations that we're having today about women's health. Because I think that when I talk about gut health and I'll talk about sleep and we talk about immune system and communication, and when I talk about women's health, especially perimenopause, all of a sudden it's like, I can't even, people cannot get enough of it because they don't hear it mm. and they're not told like, what am I supposed to eat? What am I supposed to do? Okay, my microbiome is changing. What does that even mean? What do I, you know? And I saw that there was such a hole in our community as a wellness community about communicating these these kind of things to women. Um, and there's this whole huge population, obviously 50% of our population that needs to know this knowledge um, and the nutrition side and the sleep side and all the things that we talk about um, so that's something that I've been focusing a lot on, on mm. the podcast. So thanks. awesome. So everybody can check out your new show, Save Yourself, Save, <laughs> Save Yourself with Dr. Amy Shaw. And of course, we're going to do this more. Yeah. You know, you're one wait. of my favorite people. Thank you. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. That means our children are not allowed to be in that pure essence. They're not allowed to say what they feel if it's going to hurt mom or dad. And that's really dysfunctional. That's why we grow up to not know who we truly are.